Super Monkey Ball one of Sega's lesser appreciated game series, recently just got a brand new entry to its game catalog. Go! Revealed in early 2024 during a Nintendo Partner Direct, fans were ecstatic to see a new entry of the often forgotten franchise roll onto the Nintendo Switch. The reception of the game is, well, a bit mixed. On one hand, the fans are claiming it's one of the best entries in the series with generally favorable reviews and positive critic reviews, yet it was recently revealed revealed that the game sales were some of the lowest in the series. But how could a game rated so favourably by its fans sell so poorly on an extremely successful platform? Today we'll be unravelling the answer to that question with my review as we dive for the goal to uncover what is the deal with Super Monkey Ball Banana Rumble. I can't tell you how happy I am to be reviewing a Super Monkey Ball in 2024, and one that is generally well received by the fans at that. Despite Super Monkey Ball having an impressive game catalogue on almost every main Nintendo home console since the GameCube, no, not you Wii U, never you, well, every good Nintendo home console, gotcha! with other releases on Nintendo handhelds, and recently new titles on modern platforms, Despite the series being more available than ever, it often still feels forgotten about, paling in comparison to the other larger Sega IPs. But why is this the case? It is not understated to claim that Super Monkey Ball has had an extremely controversial game release history ever since Banana Blitz released on the Nintendo Wii. After the debut of the well-received and beloved GameCube game Super Monkey Ball 1 and 2, the next releases seem to be heading down a much different direction, featuring simpler limiting physics and drastically easier levels that almost seem to set apart what made Super Monkey Ball unique in the first place. This isn't even the first game series to suffer this fate. We have heard this all before with the controversies surrounding the modern Paper Mario series, in which the newer titles completely abandoned its popular and acclaimed classic RPG style, completely deserting the beloved unique character designs only to be replaced with incredibly dull and limited enemies and NPCs. I absolutely dreaded that this game series was potentially left for dead and forever cursed to be catered towards a newer younger demographic with more basic and dumbed down level difficulty and design with each new game release. But then, something unbelievable happened. Banana Rumble came, well, rumbling in, changing everything. In order to provide insight into the potential reasons on why the game didn't sell well, let's first run through my review of the game and how it stacks up to the highly regarded first two titles. Let's start by identifying the one standalone reason that Banana Rumble was able to break free of the generic curse of its previous releases, and that reason is outstanding level design. Super Monkey Ball is comprised of two basic game modes, the platforming levels where you need to navigate to the end of the level without falling off the stage, and the multiplayer party games where you compete in various Mario Party-like games with other players. The Super Monkey Ball series at its core is a platforming game. The multiplayer games are a fantastic bonus, but the core meat and potatoes is all about the platforming levels, which we will be starting off this review with. The game premise is so simple, but so good. You play as one of the monkey characters in a giant rolling ball and you have to navigate a platforming stage to the goal. Simple, but could you imagine how stressful the first day on the job of this game would be if you were in the monkey's shoes? Ah, you must be the new monkey on the block. Well, before you get started, do you have any questions? Yeah, I've got a couple questions like, how do I get out of this ball? I understand that you put the lid on to get in, but how do I actually escape? <gasps> it, is that gonna happen to me? That guy just fell off the stage. Is this like a Lakitu type situation where I get pulled back up? Also, how do I breathe? Oh, you. You've only got 60 seconds left on your timer. Go out there and get rolling. Hurry up! Yeah, I guess you're right. Let's just get this over with. No! Fallout! The first two entries are regarded as some of the best games in the series, and even some of the best games of its console at the time, the GameCube, largely in part due to how fun and creative the levels featured in these games were. Conversely, at least in my opinion, the next entries in the series focused on introducing new gimmicks such as the, uh, jump feature? 
This significantly dumbed down the level design by introducing slower botched game physics. We hate jumping here. Whenever I see stairs or need to jump over an inconvenient object, I just turn around and walk the other way. That's how badly Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz has scarred me. Just take a look at the most recent Banana Mania release, a modern reimagining of the first two games ported to the newer game engine. I'm not alone in thinking that this modern release was a massive step back in comparison to the original titles. The modern game engine just doesn't cater to the original level designs. It's incredibly awkward to control your monkey and it just felt worse than it was in the originals. How is it even possible to make a modern re-release be worse than the original games it was based off of? And the worst part is this happens all the time. It is baffling to me that most modern re-releases of older games, more times than not, turn out to be worse than the original. Okay everyone, listen up, it's very important. We've got the straightforward task of porting an older game to a new console for a re-release. Does anyone have any ideas before we get started? Oh, ah, uh, yeah. What if we just change everything? It's clear that the new engine was not adjusted at all to be similar to the frantic and fast design of the original games, making the game fall flat in comparison to the original series. I mean, just look at the review score difference of the original games made over 20 years ago in comparison to the modern updated remaster with fancy new features. This isn't just my opinion, it is objectively a much worse game. So how did Banana Rumble break this curse and manage to produce some of the most original and challenging levels in the series? Banana Rumble manages to accomplish this solely due to two primary reasons, which we will dive into now. The first aspect that I believe this game excels at is adapting to the modern physics engine and producing levels that are centered around showcasing the new gameplay mechanic introduced. Now that sounds like a lot, but hear me out. Earlier I mentioned how dreadful and shoehorned in the jump feature felt in the Wii title Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz. They added jumping to a game about rolling around on the floor. How did they think this was a good idea? Fallout! Jokes aside, the idea could work on paper, but it just made the game lose so much of its weight and appeal when compared to the original games. It's similar to the whole Call of Duty boots on ground argument. This resulted in stages that were designed around jumping which felt like a completely different game in comparison to the original. Alternatively, Banana Rumble took a different approach by introducing a much more natural movement mechanic, dashing. Instead of implementing movement on an entirely new axis, which would result in a completely different gameplay experience, dashing allows you to do a short boost in line with the existing physics engine, meaning the designs of these newer levels could be easier and smoother to implement, rather than reinventing the whole wheel adding in the jump-centered stage segments. With the introduction of a much more comprehensive and sensible gameplay mechanic, the new levels were designed in a very similar fashion to the well-beloved first two games. And surprise surprise, would you know it, one of the very reasons for this was that one of the original stage designers, Yukio Oda, had a hand at designing some of the new levels, stating, I think the originality of the first Super Monkey Ball is the DNA of the series. So I made Banana Rumble keeping all of this in mind while also trying to adapt it to the changing times and the needs of the players. Absolute fire. Well said, I couldn't agree more. And the good news is, this game truly reflects this motive. I'm so happy to see this vision was met in this game. Almost unanimously in all of the positive reviews of this title, the reviews praise the unique stage design being a memorable aspect of the game. Banana Rumble introduces a range of stages that feel fresh and exciting, and not to mention super memorable and fun to play. To touch on Yukio Oda's wise words, the thing that I personally remember liking the most about playing the original Monkey Ball games were absolutely blitzing through the levels by smashing through them as quickly as possible, using unconventional methods of skipping large parts of the stages to fly to the goal. I remember being gobsmacked when I watched original YouTube videos of people doing stage skips for world records. It absolutely blew my mind that the game could be played in such a different way. Banana Rumble keeps this design philosophy in mind by introducing a whole range of engaging levels that benefit greatly from the dash feature, allowing you to zip through the levels in your very own methods just like in the original titles. 
there are two specific stages that come to mind that I would like to showcase that do a fantastic job of utilising the new spin dash technique. Uh, spoiler warning, I guess for the game, in case you don't want to see some of the late game stages, but we're months after the game release, so I think we're in the clear, but just wanted to put that out there. World 10 8th level wipeout is a great example of the stage being centred around the dash mechanic. This stage is a classic slow burning level designed to be large in size to make you hold to the goal as you only have 60 seconds to finish the stage, often resulting in a lot of close calls of only just managing to edge to the goal right before the timer ends. In this level you have to progress through a large stage that has a rotating platform striking you. In this clip of mine I am running low on time, so I can utilise the dash to speed up my jumps on the platform to get to the end faster, but my favourite part is where the goal is located, there's a massive gap that you actually have to utilise a dash to get to. This is a great example of how the stage is designed seamlessly around the new dash feature, retaining the fun and faithfulness of the original games. The second level I want to showcase is from the World 10 Extra Levels, where you have to jump between these platforms that get increasingly harder as more walls appear to block your jumps as you progress. Think of it as the Super Monkey Ball equivalent of the Chuckster Shine Sprite level from Super Mario Sunshine, but with a lot more control over your character and a whole less falling into the void over and over. Chucksters. You have the option to dash into each jump ramp boost in each segment, with you actually starting the level beneath the goal initially, and rotating back to the first platform last, in order to get enough height to cannonball into the goal. When I first cleared the level I misaligned my jump and landed early but was able to bounce into the goal luckily, which felt amazing. It just took me back to the original games and how there were so many alternative routes to beat every single level, there was no one set way. As a bit of a bonus, the last level I want to showcase is from the extra levels from World 2. In this level there are a bunch of plates that you have to navigate down to find the final plate frantically spinning with the goal in the middle. However, using the dash you can quickly bypass a lot of the stage and enter a nosedive straight to the end of the goal, and it just reminded me so much of the fun and originality of the original games. It's great to see the main single player mode of this game be the biggest highlight of the title. So let's move on to the next aspect of the game that really shines. To fully appreciate the second aspect of the level design that really shines in this title, let's take a step and roll back to visit the legacy of the first two games. Super Monkey Ball was like a fever dream to me as a kid when I first played it on the GameCube. This game had an outstanding single player and multiplayer modes. But why did this game in particular hook me in so much? What kept bringing me back to this particular title? One simple reason which seemed to break almost every known Nintendo game rule. Difficulty. The original Super Monkey Ball is extremely difficult, which challenged so many Nintendo game norms. The single player game mode introduced a huge variety of super challenging levels, and on top of that, you only had two lives to beat all of the 50 hardest stages back to back, which then unlocks the extra set of stages. And then on top of that, you would need to beat the 10 extra stages without using a continue to reach the final penultimate stages in the game, the master stages. Fun fact, want to traumatise a Super Monkey Ball fan with one image? Well, you don't even need to show them this image, just tell them the following words. Exam C. Almost every expert mode run was diminished at the level Exam C. I still have nightmares thinking about this level, it keeps me up at night, it is so extremely difficult, it is only the 7th stage out of 50 in the expert levels, and you have to beat all of these levels with only 2 lives, it's crazy. Super Monkey Ball is the dark horse of Nintendo games, the souls like of the supposed gaming company for children. The expert mode run is such a challenging feat that most players never even got to see the expert extra stages, let alone the master set of stages. The game was so difficult that in official reviews it was criticised and had its scores reduced for being inaccessible to most casual players. 
But let me ask you a question. Is difficulty really something that should reduce a game's score? I have always retained the belief that I would prefer a game to be more difficult than easier, due to the fact that if a game is too easy, there is no way to make it a challenge. But when a game is more difficult, you are forced to learn the game mechanics. In order to progress, become a master of understanding the game's intricacies to access the most rewarding game features. Doesn't this sound familiar? A game that was criticized for being too difficult and hard to complete, yet was universally loved. You might call me crazy for drawing a parallel between Super Monkey Ball and Elden Ring's DLC, but hear me out. Both games were criticized and even had their scores reduced due to it being too difficult to pass certain barriers in the game to access late game content. But this is simply not true. Elden Ring gave the player accessibility options for the hardest fights of the game. If you're really struggling with the boss, you have the option of using a mimic tier summon, golden summon signs, and even player summons as an alternative. So how does this link to Super Monkey Ball's difficulty? Let me explain. Super Monkey Ball 2 later released and is in my opinion the best original game in the series, excluding Deluxe as it is a compilation of 1 and 2. Take notes Banana Mania, that's how you do a good compilation game. It tackled the difficulty complaints head on by allowing the player to purchase additional lives from the shop, so they weren't stuck with only 3 attempts to complete the 50 expert levels and then the additional 10 extra levels to access the master levels. You will still have to grind out and practice the hardest levels in order to beat them, but you are no longer absolutely hard stuck on only having 3 attempts. You have up to 99 opportunities now to do so. So now let's warp back to the present. As I mentioned earlier, Banana Rumble revisited the series roots by introducing incredibly creative level designs with really good difficulty, with the addition of tools assisting new players without sacrificing the difficulty for veteran players. In order to assist new players, you now have the option to simply skip a level in the menu, but for dedicated players that want the original experience, you can just keep replaying that level until you finish it, just like the original. Sure, I can understand the argument it's a tad disappointing that there isn't a challenge mode with 50 levels back to back that you have to beat in limited lives, but this is a perfect middle ground for people that are wanting the original difficulty challenge, while allowing newcomers to experience every level without giving up. Banana Rumble addresses the issues of the overwhelming difficulty by still having extremely difficult levels, but optional tools for people to bypass this, it's up to them. And that is why I think this game nails the difficulty for the largest amount of people ever seen in the series. Both veterans and newcomers alike will have a blast playing through this game's story levels. To top off the best aspects of this game section of this video, the last segment we are going to quickly discuss is the world game design and music. Super Monkey Ball's art aesthetic has always been a massive high point of the series, and this new title is no exception. This game graphically is bar none the best entry in the series, showcasing a diverse range of 10 exceptionally unique worlds to explore. Sega really went all out to make sure the colours and the themes of each level are so unique, and it's great to see the levels have unique gimmicks exclusive to the worlds that they reside in. Some of my favourites are the invisible platforms that fade in and out in a rhythm at the Live Monkey Concert World, and the tea party aesthetic incorporating plates and teacups in the Rose Garden level. The world and stage design are just so coherent with each other, it's fantastic. Each of these worlds have incredibly polished aesthetics with a clear theme tied into the level design, which is a blast to play through. This next section I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but it's something I wanted to bring up and I plan to expand on this in a future video, but I thought it was worth mentioning that when I was a kid I would often sketch out new game ideas for sequels that I would love to see game developers make. To give you some perspective about the time frame that this was developed, yeah I made ideas for Luigi's Mansion 2 and Metroid Prime 3, both of which had yet to be announced. Boy do I have some bad news for my younger self about the development time frame of Metroid Prime 4. In my Super Monkey Ball 3 Ideas folder, I recalled one of my favourite levels that I desired as a kid was a candy themed world. And lo and behold, this game actually finally introduced a stage theme that I'd wanted since I was 8 years old, almost 20 years prior. This says volume about this game's stage design and how it aligned to the original game series. They were able to capture my imagination as a child playing the original series and have it applied to a new game. This is just the icing on top of the cake for me. Now obviously, being an 8 year old, my designs are terrible. It literally just has a candy cane and a chocolate block. 
but the idea was there and it absolutely blew my mind seeing the amount of detail in this level. It was one of my favorite in the series. All of the world designs are so varied and stand out so much by themselves and we haven't even got to the best part of the game which I will now cover. The final praise I have for this game is in my opinion my favorite aspect so I've saved it for last. I am of course referring to the soundtrack of this game. Super Monkey Ball soundtracks are criminally underrated, consistently tuning out absolutely slamming tracks since its original games. The music direction is just so unique in this series, heavily inspired by the early 2000s genre breakcore, incorporating ultra funky bass lines with vibrant drums and percussion. Just check out the groovy bass line in this track from the Monkey Mall stage in the first game. Now let's filter out the highs and really appreciate how much this bass line slaps. Now let's listen to one of the newer tracks from the series, Oceanus. Catchy, right? Let's also filter out the highs and just listen to how the series music design goes back to its roots, much like its level design. Every single world theme is so incredibly impressive, then the music just elevates it to a whole new level with super memorable music motifs and hooks. The soundtrack does not disappoint and it's super exciting to see it evolve to this point it's at. I also really like the new announcer's voice in this game. At first I was sad to see the iconic ready and go had been replaced, but the new voice actor does an amazing job and brings about a new special energy that really fits the game like a glove. My favorite quote is "Baboom" from the multiplayer games. Another song I really want to quickly touch on is the Rose Garden soundtrack. From the start of the song, it just pulls you in with its swelling orchestral riffs. And oh my god, the track using monkey sounds as ad-libs is just an amazing detail. It fits it so well. This song also just screams inspired by Persona 5, especially the introduction. Speaking of Persona 5 inspiration, this is a great segue to move away from the game's many positives and into what isn't so great about the game. At this point, we have covered all of the positive aspects of the game in my opinion, so let's highlight the not so great aspects. The easiest pick of the bunch here is the game's story. It's virtually non-existent and extremely generic, but this is a platforming game. The series isn't exactly known for having an intricate lore library, and the story is just fine but very forgettable. I don't want to focus on this aspect as there are much larger issues at play that I want to discuss, so I won't really be critiquing this aspect too much or accounting it into the final score, but I just knew I had to mention that it's funny how much this story seems to be inspired by Persona 5. I mean, just look at this villain's design, and they are a phantom thief stealing sacred treasure? We got a joker over here. The characters introduced are okay, I think they are relatively good design wise, but just a bit forgettable. They will never hold up a candle to Dr. Badboon and his assistant, what happened to him? They brought back Dr. Badboon, but the assistant is just, is just gone. But I'm so glad they did bring back Dr. Badboon. Moving on to the most pressing issue, in my opinion, of this title is the game's multiplayer. And it pains me to say this, as this is usually a massive high point of the series. One thing this game does right for multiplayer is allowing you to finally play single player levels co-op with multiple players again. It's so fun to rush to the goal competing against your friends to speed to the finish, and I love that you can toggle collision, this is amazing. You best believe that's always staying on. But that's where the praise for the multiplayer comes to an end. It's painfully annoying that the story co-op only allows you to select entire worlds to play at a time rather than being able to select individual levels like in previous titles. Again, another frustrating design choice that was cherry-picked out of the game for no logical reason, despite being present in the previous titles. 
this might not seem like a massive issue, but if you wanted to play the 10th level of World 2 and then move on to, let's say, the 6th level of World 8, you would have to play every single level of World 2 in the exact same order every time and then return and select World 8 to slog it out to get to that second level you want to play. It's just a frustrating step back that provides no benefit that you have to play entire worlds in the exact same order every time, making the experience so much more mundane and less dynamic. But this is just a nitpick in comparison to the game's main multiplayer mode. In previous entries, there would be a massive variety of party games to play with your friends. This title introduces 5 main modes for multiplayer with the brand new exciting feature of having up to 16 players compete at any time. Now, let me be clear. I'm all for having a smaller selection of games that are more polished. I think this is actually a really good idea. The thing that falls flat is that the performance of this is abysmal on the Switch. There are constant frame drops and extreme lag for one single player duking it out in online mode. The story mode is rock solid 60 frames per second, so it's extremely disappointing to see the multiplayer pale so awfully in comparison in the exact same game. But performance issues aside, these can be later resolved in a port. The biggest issue with multiplayer is that there is only one single player on one console that can compete in multiplayer games. This is doing the Switch, a home console, such an injustice by missing a massive opportunity that you can't play the multiplayer mode with more than one person online, but you can play single player co-op. How does this even make any sense? Again, maybe this can be overlooked when it gets ported to new consoles and you won't be relying on having one system for two players, but overall, the quality of the new games are just a bit hit and miss in my opinion. There are definitely some modes I enjoy significantly more than others. Monkey Race is fantastic and one of the most solid entries. I love that the stages are based off of the single player worlds. This mode is essentially unchanged from previous games. It's similar to Mario Kart, you just have to race to the end. But in this title, it's one big lap instead of multiple laps, which I actually really enjoy, and the items are always a blast. This is a really good mode. Oh no! One of my favorite moments of this game was when I uncovered that the banana farm stage is actually a race stage comprised of multiple stages from previous Super Monkey Ball games, especially Super Monkey Ball 2. This is a fantastic high point for the multiplayer, and it's super fun zipping through stages that previously would have been so challenging to get through. It's genius, this is one of my favorite game modes they've ever made. My next favorite game is Goal Rush. In this game mode, there are a bunch of goals situated on downward slope map that your team has to run through to claim. This mode does a great job utilizing the dash mechanic to make your monkey reach supersonic levels of speed as you zip to the ultra rare goals that appear before anyone else in the opposite team. This mode is really fun. In general, I think any of the multiplayer modes that incorporate the platforming aspect of the single player is a really good addition and super fun with 16 plays. So great job, Sega. I really want to see more of this. Coming up next is Baboom, which is a classic hot potato mode, and I don't really have a lot of complaints for this one. It's a solid game mode, again, utilizing the dash mechanic well to bump into foes and slip away from them tagging you. But oh boy, here's where it gets not so great. The last two are very underwhelming in my opinion. Robot Rush just has way too much going on at any point. I like the idea of using the stage to zip up and hit the heads of the robot, but it just isn't as fun as the other modes. I think it would have been a better idea to have everyone on the same team taking down a giant boss. I think that just would have worked better. Banana Hunt is just <laughs> boring. Sorry to all the Banana Hunt lovers out there, but I'm just never really a fan of these collect all the coins modes. It really just doesn't offer anything new. With 3 out of 5 of the new game modes being really good, the multiplayer is solid, but the next worst issue is that you can't even select what mode you want to play when you queue online. So more often than not, you'll be queued up to play Banana Hunt, then back to Robot Rush, and then guess what? Back to Banana Hunt, with no selection of voting at all. It's infuriating! This game could have really benefited from a Mario Kart-like voting system, where players just take turns at voting what they want to play. It's disappointing to see absolute classics such as Monkey Target and Bowling not return that are fan favorites, but I can appreciate the new direction they're taking the multiplayer games. And overall, I think they're okay. They just have a lot of fine tuning to do. But the worst part ties all into the main theme of this video. 
almost every online lobby is just full of bot players due to the game having an abysmal ah. player base. It's really sad. The potential of versing 16 people in real time is so amazing, but it's super disappointing only getting queued up against one or two real players that pose an actual challenge, with the rest just being bots that fired around to always be so far behind on the points in the competition. It's a huge letdown as the 16 player multiplayer is a fantastic selling point and feature of the game, but you only ever get to verse one or two real players at any time. You can't play with another friend on the same system and the performance is abysmal to top it all off. So that about sums up my thoughts on the multiplayer in a nutshell and well, it is really something. So I've covered the best aspects and the worst aspects of the game. What do I think about the game overall? In my opinion, this game is a solid 8 out of 10. It single-handedly offers the best single-player experience to date since the first two debut games, adding in a whole host of unique and incredibly fun single-player levels to play through. The multiplayer is definitely the most disappointing aspect of the game, having terrible performance, boring modes that can't be skipped, and every lobby being full of bots that offer no challenge at all, rarely encountering other human players. But this game struck gold where it needed to. The single player is literally so good that you can get enough value out of the game by just playing the 200 new stages and then replaying them again in co-op with your friends, it's great. It's a shame you have to play the entire worlds in order and you can't pick the exact ones, but the stage aesthetics are some of the best in the series, and the music sets a new bar of how amazing this series soundtrack can be, so it's okay playing the entire world in a row. It's a massive step in the right direction to be able to play the single player co-op again. So we've now covered my review of the game by looking at the core gameplay, the single player story levels and the multiplayer modes of the title, and we are left with the age old question of today's video. Why did it flop so bad? Almost the entire majority of this video I have praised and yapped about how this game is a massive step in the right direction for the series, rating it at 8 out of 10. Yet the game underperformed sales expectations, potentially casting a looming doubt over the future of the entire series as a whole. To get a deeper understanding on this, we have to go back to the announcement. So let's take a look at the announcement video during the Nintendo Partner Direct early this year in 2024. While the Partner Directs aren't as popular as the mainline Directs, being announced in a Partner Direct is still going to get the game out to a lot of viewers and potential buyers, especially long-term fans of the series. This was Sega's chance to finally acknowledge them going back to the roots of the first two games, especially in relation to the stage design, bringing back one of the original stage designers who even quoted how the originality of the first game shaped the series' direction entirely and that Banana Rumble kept this in mind, trying to adapt to it. So finally, the trailer is revealed, and what was that? It was almost entirely based on the multiplayer mode, which isn't even the best aspect of the game. It's arguably the worst. In all the interviews with the game developers I touched on earlier, the original designers are ecstatic to share how the game is a love letter for the first two games, with the levels being some of the best they've ever created. But this isn't shown at all in the trailer. Over 50% of the trailer is just covering the new multiplayer modes, providing a very jarring outlook onto the game, being mainly a party game. And worst of all, that it's similar to the other banana game titles. Couple this reveal with the game having extremely limited marketing outside of the Direct. Ever since I saw that initial trailer, I was amped to pick up this game day one to support the series, but then the release date just kind of rolled around and I didn't even realise it was out. I just saw no ads for it at all, unlike other Switch titles which I just get so much ads for, even ones I already own. And perhaps most insultingly at all, I remember seeing so much marketing for the previous Banana Mania release, and well, yeah that game was not amazing. It was somehow worse than the games that it was based on. It really is just such a shame that this game was not advertised for its best feature of all, the return to the best levels ever created in the series since the original games. Ever since the Wii release of Banana Blitz, every game has marketed to have the word banana in the title, and this has created an unintentional subconscious effect that this game was going to be more similar to the other banana titles, rather than the original two that it's literally quoted to be the most common with. This Reddit comment summarised it best. The game should have just been called Super Monkey Ball 3. 
If it is more in line with the original 2, it is the first successor to the original games, and it would have clearly set the theme of the game more than any title with the name Banana in it. Oh, Super Monkey Ball. In the end, Super Monkey Ball Banana Rumble is a fantastic game and one of the best Monkey Ball games ever made, but a combination of factors really held back this game from being the true Super Monkey Ball 3 that it should have been. Ranging from the marketing being completely non-existent and botched, the multiplayer features being the main focus in promotional material despite it being the weakest gameplay feature and the absolutely criminal lack of emphasis on how amazing the return to the roots gameplay of, of the single player levels is during any trailer or promotional work. This game was unfortunately done an injustice due to its marketing. This game is such an amazing love letter to the first two games, but it would be such a disappointment if this is the last one when it is shown that it has so much potential for the future of the series. So, what do you think of this game? Do you agree that it is one of the best Monkey Ball games in the series? If you haven't played any game in the series before, would you consider trying it based off the arguments I put forward in today's video? Let me know what you think about the game and any potential reasons on why it performed badly in the comments below. Overall, I think this game is a fantastic experience with all the issues I mentioned. I would just hate to see the series end on such an amazing game when it provided the most promising glimpse into the potential of this series since the original two games released over 20 years ago. Thanks so much for watching my analysis of Super Monkey Ball Banana Rumble. If you've made it this far into the video, comment I, I loves bananas, so I know that you watched the entire video. If you made it this far, you are a true Wow It's Bow fan, and I appreciate you lots. If you enjoyed, make sure to subscribe and check out some of my other reviews of games that I also think are criminally underrated. Thanks again, and as always, I'll catch you in the next one.